Hey, this is Mr. Barrington. Um, I'm going to work through a, a AP calculus exam for y'all. And y'all have your assignment on, it's been sent to you via Remind 101, and it's linked on my website. Um, so you can access it there to just know that, you know, there's that open forum blogging that you're going to do about a few questions that I work through that you may not have, you may may or may not have questions on. It might just be like, that, that question was very interesting. That's a good application. Or uh, that, that little trick Mr. Berenson did on one of these questions was, was, was kind of funky. But anyway, I don't want to waste your time. I'm going to work through this thing as fast as I can. But first, I need to do some, um, some things you need to hear. So, so make sure, I've got some notes here. Make sure you um, pay attention to this, okay? So you got to pay attention. All right. Um, so the AP exam is in a few sections, all right? Let's go ahead and zoom in here. So for you visual folks, um, it's section one. Actually, I've got it right here. Section one and two are multiple choice, okay? So here we have the 60 minute and the 30 minute time block. Section one, 28 questions and 60 in 60 minutes. Section two, all right, 17 questions in 30 minutes, okay? That's what I'll be doing, but I'll do it much faster than that, okay? I, look, I have no idea. They just don't like 29 through 75 for whatever reason. Anyway, uh, after that you get a break, okay, 15 minutes or 5 or whatever whatever they give you. And then on to the next section, so multiple choice first, and then FRQ, sections 3 and 4, free response questions. There's a 30 minute section, one is a calculator section. So they switch it up on you. First you can't use your calculator on a multiple choice, then you can use your calculator on the FRQ. I have no idea, okay. You only get two questions with your calculator, which is actually a good thing, y'all. Uh, you want you want the non-calculator FRQs more than the calculator. Calculator ones tend to be more difficult. All right. Uh, so 30 minutes for the two uh, calculator FRQs, 60 for the non. Okay. And there's four of them. All right. So and then we'll be done. That's it. That's what y'all are gonna do on the 5th of May, I believe. Uh, I got to double check, but. Okay, so I'm going to do a grading portion, but I want to show you first this. Okay, take a look. All right, so basically, this, this is the multiple choice side of things. FRQ is different, I'll show you that in a second. Basically, this table tells you what a person would have made, one, two, three, four, five, had they scored in this range of multiple choice. Okay, so obviously, many people that only got zero to 16 correct in the multiple choice, uh, made a one, 93%. So multiple choice is very key, very important. But look how there's not that much differentiation between the two and the three, okay? What does that tell you? FRQs is what we really need to focus on because a lot of folks that did, I mean, pretty much all these are almost the same, you know, same for two, is it almost the same for two? In fact, more people um, scored, uh, had less <laughs> answers correct on the multiple choice that scored a two. More people had less answers correct on the multiple choice that scored a two that, and then, then scored a three. So what does that tell you? FRQs are huge. That's why we practice a lot of them. But anyway, this is how many people, 23% of all kids made a one on the AP exam uh, last year. All right. And this is for actually for 2008, okay? They only send out score reports every four or five years. So 15% made a two, 17% made a nine, 21, 21, all right? So, and that's just basically um, restating what I just said, okay? All right, so, so it kind of gives you the idea, how many multiple choice do I need to get right? Well, if you're in the 60% range, you're doing pretty good, okay? So hopefully I can get to 100%. I'll probably beat though. Okay, so next, FRQs. This is what we're going to do at the end of the video. Um, so we'll multiply.
multiply the multiple choice by a certain number, okay? And you can write this stuff down if you want to. Uh, this is what we'll do on Saturdays when we, uh, when we meet up on Saturday. So basically, each question's out of nine points, and I'll grade myself using keys online. I haven't looked at the answers. I haven't even, I briefly looked at the questions um, just to make sure there were A, B, A, B questions, not B, C, or crazy nonsense questions. But basically, and then they're multiplied by a certain parameter. Some questions end up being out of seven, so they have to multiply by like 1.22 or something like that. And then you average two sections. They're completely average. One note, you don't get any points uh, if you leave an answer blank. Never leave a multiple choice answer blank. It doesn't matter. It just co comes into this composite score. So that's, you can see how that works right there. And then you can see how that works right there. Okay. And since you can pretty much estimate, this is 54 points. Okay. So, I mean, technically if you're um, you showed up late to the AP exam and you blasted, um, um, you blasted the, the FRQs out of the water um, and got every single one of them right. You could make four, but I'm not saying you could do, you should do that or could sh could do that or should do that. I'm just telling you the how it works out. Okay, so hopefully that helps. A couple more things before I get started. All right. So we went over that, we went over that, grading portion, we'll do that at the end of the video. I might attach a separate video. Um, materials. Uh, you're going to use pencil, obviously, but in order for it to show up on the screen, I've got to use pen. I've got my calculator, it's my, it's, my, it's my calculator on here, so it's really slow, but I'm going to try to be as fast as I can, okay? Because I left my calculators at school, which was bad. Um, so you need some water and a snack, and you need rest. Another, another thing is just to stay hydrated. If you're dehydrated, and then you chug a bunch of water the night before the AP exam, you're going to have to go to TT the whole time during the AP exam. Okay, that's not how you're hydrated. You stay, you get hydrated. You got to get hydrated days and days in advance, about four, three, four days in advance before, or the whole time in order to be hydrated. That way you won't be cranky, you won't see it be getting tired and doing the AP exam, all that stuff. Snacks and rest are, are huge. Rest, you gotta stay rested, get plenty of rest <clears throat> so you're not cranky, um, you know, your mood swings, you get discouraged, all that stuff. And you're alert. Snack, it just, everybody's happy with some food. I love food. So have a snack during the AP exam. I'll provide a little bit of a breakfast type deal for us, but you need a snack for the AP exam. All right, so hydrate. We talked about hydrated, hydratedness. Be careful, okay, careful with caffeine. And the reason I say this is, you know, somebody thinks, oh my gosh, I got this three hour test. I'm gonna knock out two monsters. You're gonna be flipping out the whole time. You're not gonna be able to do any work. You're, and, and then again, caffeine's a diuretic, so you're going to be having to pee the whole time. So, easy on the caffeine. All right? And if you're fast-forwarding this, that's okay. That's fine. Um, all right. So, so yeah. I briefly looked through this, but this is off the cuff, y'all. I could do one of these wrong. We'll look at the keys. Um, if it's less than an hour, we'll go to the keys in this video. If it's more, if it ends up being an hour or more, we, I'll post a separate video grading myself. Now, I'm not perfect, okay? There might be a little twist in the AP exam that, or a wrinkle that I haven't seen in a while. I might get a question wrong. Um, I'll admit it, I'm not perfect, but that's, that's okay. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty confident that I'll score close to 100%, if not 100%, but you never know. Things happen. All right. So, do -do -do -do. Okay. All right, yeah, technology. Guys, you get a calculator. You get a you get a graphing calculator for the calculator portion. That's it. Okay? You don't there, there's no scientific calculator, there's no nothing. You get a graphing calculator for the calculator portion. That's it. All right. No calculator means no calculator. 
And no, you won't have to be able to do markers and all that. Just strictly pencil on the AP exam. All right. So I think I've talked about everything. Here we go. We're about to get started. So I'm going to set the timer for... need to rotate it because these questions are horizontal. I'm going to set the timer for um, 60 minutes just to record. It's not going to take me 60 minutes. I'm just to record. Well, I'll put the stopwatch. How about that? Okay. I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> I haven't worked through an entire one of these in a while. I've worked through hundreds of them. Uh, maybe even thousands, but not an entire one in timing myself on video. So, all right, here we go. All right, no calculator. Yeah, that, that's definitely one through, whatchamacallit. Um, I'm gonna rotate it this way, get settled in. Uh, I need to rotate you back that way. All right, and here we go. All right, limit of the, uh, x approaches infinity, okay? So this is not written in a form that I could plug infinity in. It's just not, I mean, it's not good. So I'm gonna foil it out. Wait, let me use black, that's better. first one down it wasn't written like I wanted to so I pulled it out I know that uh, x squares are going to overpower the x's and the constants so there you go I think I'm going to keep the timer oh, next to me as I go What didn't put it in the right form for my answer, but that's okay. Very sloppy product rules. Okay, I notice my answers are not in the right form. Let's see what I can do with this.
BCF right there. Square foot two, seven eight square foot two, seven foot two. All right. I'm going about a minute of questions. Not too bad. Oh, this is bad. Um, you can do two U subs. Split them up. So yeah, two U subs would basically make a constant of one half. Y'all seen this a hundred times, so I'm not going to go through it. Oop, almost messed up there. About a minute and 15 a question. Not too bad a pace. Cancel plus and zero. That was a nice question, quick and easy. Oh, we've done this a hundred times. Has a limit. If it has a limit, that means uh, they basically, um, well, oh, this is interesting. Let's see how this works out. Let's break this down a little bit. All right, so if it has a limit, then the limit as x approaches 2 from the left equal the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Okay, yeah. All right, so just find the limit on, on the left. Well, actually, this is the left and right. So, um, so, so obviously they're equal, but let's make sure that that's not a vertical asymptote right there. Let's go ahead and see if we... Uh, okay, so... All right. All right, all right, I see where this is going. Yeah, they have a limit, so that's good. Continuous, now, from the left and the right, they're going to four, but at the point, it's one, so that's a left, right, four, or four, and then one, that's not, no, it's not continuous. And differentiable. Well, this derivative, so we would have to do f prime of x. All right. All right. We'll take that derivative because that's what it is. That's one. And then take that derivative. That's zero. Well, the derivatives. Um, the limit of the derivatives are equal, but the deriv but the derivatives no the limit limit of the derivatives are not equal. Okay, so the slope just happens to me. Well, I'm getting off into all kind of crazy connections. Basically, the derivatives don't equal. Uh, at two, um, this is left and right, and this is at two, so uh, it should not be differentiable as well. Okay, so what on? All right, here we go. I'm on question seven. I'm slowing down my pace. I'm about one and a half minutes of question. Okay, initial condition, position. Right, position is going to equal sorry initial condition okay position 
Well, let's go ahead and find t of 1. 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared plus 2. 3 to the 1 plus 3 plus 2, 6. Not too bad. Alright. Derivative of that, chain rule. Negative sign. Get up and down. Five and nine. Gotta know you're in a circle. Got to. Got to. So that becomes pi over three. Sine of pi over three. Pi over three. Pi over three is bigger than pi over four, so it's right here. That's a long y. A long y is square root of three over two. All right, so negative three squared of three over two. Trace that in. All right, I've caught up a little bit on my time. I'm about a minute and 20 seconds piece. Oh, Lord. Now, this is the one we haven't really done yet, but I'm going to go ahead and show it to you kind of slow. But I gotta move fast, this video is gonna be super long. Starting at negative two, this is the area under the curve. Starting at negative two, going to x. That could be any x, right? So you gotta think about area. So negative three, all right? Negative two to negative three. That's gonna be area, but then I'm gonna flip flop. It's not in the correct order from negative two to negative three. It's not in the correct order. So instead of positive area, that's gonna be negative. So that's a negative area, that doesn't matter. Negative two, well that's a negative two to negative two, that's just this one line. So that's zero area. You understand this now, you're a beast. Okay, g of zero, so that's this area right here, that's gonna be a rectangle plus a, that's basically three units squared, that's what it is, g of one. That's another unit, so that's four units squared. And g of 2, that's minus another unit squared, so that's 3 units squared. So basically, here we go. Okay? That's a tough one. you got to understand that if you want to make a 5. Okay? So, alright, let's keep moving. The graph of function shown above. I'm kind of slow. I'm still about a minute 15 per question. Uh, the following, which has least value? Okay, 0 to 3. Integral from 1 to 3, you know that's the area. Okay, so you can guesstimate that as, I don't know, well, let's, I don't know. Left Riemann sum approximation, one to three, f of x to four sub intervals of equal length. Well, that's a left L ram, that's gonna go here, 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 here. I already know that's more, is the upper sum. Right Riemann sum, not even gonna do that, can't be the answer, that's more. Midpoint Riemann sum, nope. Left Riemann sum's got to be trapezoidal sum. Trapezoidal is going to be smoother to the curve, so it's going to be less by default. So, battle between these two, this one wins. All right. So, next, graph of function f shown above. Let's form the graph by prime. Okay, so we we're looking at the derivative, which is the um, slope of the tangent line. So if we're increasing, here decreasing, here increasing, so my derivative is gonna go from, it's gonna go positive, negative, positive. Above, below, above. In that order, we're switching at about there. So above, below, above. There we go. There you go, all right, there you go. Alright, f prime of x is equal to 2x. Uh, another chain rule, f prime of x is equal. <clears throat> Alright, first I gotta write this nicely though. f of x is equal to e to the 2x to the negative 1. See, that's what people don't do. You gotta write it nicely. Alright, so you do your chain rule, e stays e, 2x to the negative 1 stays that. Then you take the derivative of that. I'm gonna do it off to the side. 2x to the negative 1. Do, do, do. Negative 2, x to the negative 2 minus 1. So that makes negative 2x squared. Okay? 
So let's see which one of these mumbo jumbos get it. So I believe this one gets it. Definitely, yeah, this one. This one gets it, yeah. All right. So F of X is in. Okay. Here we have a composition. Uh, we haven't done that in a while. All that means is you got to plug this in for these X's, which is kind of crazy. Okay. So you got a composition. Mm, actually, this can be looked at as just like a chain rule. Okay. So, but let's try it the hard way first. Now, let's do the F, F of natural log X. All right, just rewrite the whole thing. Natural log X squared to natural log X. All right, so we do it that way. Now we got a chain rule right here. All right, see the out, keep the inside, derivative of the inside, plus two, constant. Natural log X, I don't know, one over X. So we got two natural log X over X plus two over X. Now that probably none of those answers look like that. Let's take a look. Well, that one does. If I get common, well, I already have common denominators and I just add them. There you go. All right. So that was, there's a, there's a rule you could have done right there. You could basically done the chain rule with that, but <laughs> you, this this way got it faster just doing the composition got it faster so let's keep moving on oh, I'm catching up almost a minute of question now polynomial function f has selected values for second derivative so this is talking about concavity well, I already know concavity from acceleration all right so which of the following statements must shoot f is increasing well I'm gonna pass on that one because it tells me my concavity F is decreasing, I'm going to pass on that one. F has a local maximum, I'm going to pass on that one too. Graph of F has a point of inflection, X equals 1. Well, this does tell me something about inflection, so that's possible. So let's go to, um, but these had a lot of trick questions on these, so you got to be careful. Um, so X equals 1, so we do pass from positive to 0 to negative, but it's discrete, it's not continuous, you're not sure, um, well, you're not sure if it does positive, zero, negative, in between, so you're not sure of what it does in between there, so uh, that, 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 it says must be true. The graph, graph changes concavity in the interval zero to two, uh, so, so zero to two, this is the interval, it's definitely concave up, and definitely concave down. So yeah, don't jump on the first answer that you think looks right. I don't see. I'm talking too much now. I'm behind on time. So let's integrate that. That's a u sub all the way. So I'm gonna work this one out. Take the right u. Divide. Well, actually multiply by a half because you know. There ain't no two up there, you know that. So I get to do here, here, for here, and here. I'm just gonna take that one half, slide it here. There's a one on top now, there's a U on the bottom, DU. Actually, I'm gonna do this. Oh, that's a natural log tool, absolute value of of uh there you go yeah <laughs> i might have worked too fast i don't know all right so let's look i think so yeah 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 okay tangent inverse Ooh. okay so sine xy equals x so this implicit differentiation so i'm going ahead and do my chain rule like crazy Right, and then get y prime by itself. So I'm going to go ahead and divide. Oh no, the minus. And then divide. Well, I guess.
guess I'll have to multiply by 1 over x. Because that's not going to work. Dividing is not going to work. So that gives you... I probably could have done this way easier. But, oh well. So let's see if any of those look good. Probably not. Nope. So what do I need common denominators? Here's where my trusty red pen comes in. Come here, trusty pen. Okay, so I'm going to do cosine xy and cosine xy. And then I'm going to have y prime equals and it's x cosine xy is a common denominator and it's 1 minus y cosine xy that better be right 1 minus y cosine xy over x is well good to go good to go bro all right so graph the function of sine 100 times x equals 2 and x equals 5 so what you do for this okay so another basically uh integration function I saw this twice like i said for what value does the graph of, uh, graph of g has a point of inflection? So, basically, <clears throat> um, this is the, uh, think of g as the position. Or, yeah, g of the position. So, point of inflection would be relating to the acceleration. Uh, that's probably a bad analogy. I'm just going to do it. Um, so, if this, if this g of x is the original function, that means f of t, which is here, is the derivative, g prime of x. And so, g double prime of x would be the derivative of this. So, I would be looking at this, these slopes right here, okay, to infer about g double prime of x. So, the slopes change from positive to negative. So, that's a point of inflection. And then negative to positive. So, that's a point of inflection of g, okay? So, how many points of inflection? Two and five. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. All this explaining, I'm short on my time. I got to get back to a minute of question. X y plane x y x plus y equals k over k is a constant with tangent to the graph of what? Blah, blah, blah. Y equals x squared plus three x plus one. So I'm looking for. Oh. This is just telling me this, this, that's a tangent line equation. That, that's dead to me. I'm going to get it in slope intercept form. Now, that, what this tells me is my slope of the tangent line equals 1. Negative 1, sorry. So, if I know the slope of the tangent line equals negative 1, I know the derivative equals negative. Y, y prime equals negative 1. So I'm going to say it as f prime of x equals negative 1, which will become the derivative, which is f prime of x equals 2x plus 3. And then so negative 1 equals 2x plus 3. And then minus 3 from both sides, negative 4 equals 2x. Divide x equals negative 2. Bam. Well, that's just x. I'm trying to find k. So now I've got to go back and find y and rewrite the whole doggone home, oh boy. So... Let's find y. y equals negative 2 squared plus 3 becomes negative 2 plus 1. y equals 4 minus 6 plus 1. Don't let this question get you discouraged, y'all. It's just, I mean, this. some of them are harder than others. And so I'm going to rewrite the equation. y minus y1 equals x. And then x minus x1. y minus plus 1 equals slope negative 1 uh, x minus plus 2 so y equals negative 4 x minus 2 minus 1 so y equals negative 1 x minus 3 yay so basically the k was 3 negative 3 sorry yeah that one took me a long time I'm I'm Losing time. Got to go. What are all the horizontal asymptotes? So you got to remember HA limit. Oh my gosh, a limit. You got to take the x to infinity to find the horizontal asymptote. So basically those don't matter. Okay. So if we're taking this to infinity... 2 to the infinity power, negative 2 to the infinity power. So, um, 
you basically got this is going huge, this is going super huge, but one's positive, one's negative. I can rewrite this as right? Yeah. And that's it. So cancel, cancel. One divided by negative one, negative one. So that's one of them. What about the other one? Limit as x approaches negative infinity. Well, here's, here's the deal here, guys. This is going to flip these. So watch. No, don't, don't change that channel. So 5, 1, 1, 2 to the infinity minus 1, 2 to the infinity. Both of those are going to become zero. So, oh, so here, these were big, and those cancel. Here, these were small, and they cancel. So that's equal to five. So negative one and five. So they're getting a little difficult now, and I'm losing time. I gotta hurry up. Let f be the function with the second derivative given by f prime of x equals f double prime of x over x squared x. Point of inflection. All right. So set them equal to zero. X squared equals zero. Okay. So you gotta test them. Test, uh, test negative one. Negative one is going to give me positive times a negative times a negative. So that's positive. Uh, one is going to give me um, positive times a positive times a negative times a negative. This, okay. So already I know my answer. Well, I think. Hold on. No, I don't. Now it's narrowed down to these two because uh, zero is not an inflection point. Anyway, uh, I can tell that this is gonna change sign. It's gonna be positive, positive, negative, uh, negative, and there's a negative, and this is gonna be uh, positive, 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 so that's gonna be positive. So here's where it changes concavity right there, so we definitely got that right there. All right, so you'll have a bowl sheet on the AP exam, by the way. Particle move bowl, straight line is x. That's x of t, that's position. Pass S1 on tangents, point of inflection of 2. So what value of T is the velocity of the... So you're looking at the velocity of the particle when increasing. So you want to find out when the slope of the velocity is positive, which is hard because the slope of the velocity depends on the, the slope of the velocity. The velocity is the first derivative. The slope of the first derivative depends on the second derivative. So what's the second, what's the second derivative? Acceleration. So the slope of the velocity will be based on the acceleration. So you want to find out when the acceleration is positive. So, yeah. Right there. Okay. That's where we're concave up. So zero to. Okay. All right. Man, I'm bad on time. Remember, spread it from top of the end. If you don't swim, I feel like I've heard the rumor. Which of the following differential equations can you model? Alright, so it, it, it's proportional to the product of the number of people who have heard the rumor and the number of people who have not heard the rumor. Okay? So basically, it's proportional to if if we make t the number of people are so proportional to the product. So here's a product, all right? It's p times, and here's the people who haven't heard the rumor. The whole population is n, right? And since it's proportional, you always had a k, which is a constant of proportionality. If we had finished our slope field section like on time, like. Like if we had enough time to do that, we would have talked definite huge amounts about the like constant of proportionality, but we didn't. Boom. So that's wow, that's simple. Very, very simple. Okay. So there you go. P times KP times N minus P. Yeah. Alright, so and I'm doing bad on time. Uh solution, initial condition. All right, diff EQ, separate the variables, go. All right.
Okay, so the initial condition, negative 2, 3. 3 cubes, 27 times 2 is 54. They always give you something easy to manipulate. Like this, 54 divided by 3 is... 54 divided by 3 is... My brain's not working. Okay, melt down. Warning, warning. 18. Square both sides. Minus. Okay. Oops. So the C equals negative 14. So uh, we see it right here. Okay. Um, interesting thing right here. We've got two. Um, we got a positive and a negative version. I'm not sure what that's getting at. Um, mine was positive, so I'm going with positive. Okay. Function f has a twice as. Okay. So that's a point two comma one. The slope of two is four. It's concave up. What is the value of approximation using the line tangent of f of 1.8 line 9 using the line tangent of the graph of f at x equals 2? All right, so we need a uh, tangent line equation. Y minus 1 equals the slope, which is 4x minus 2. 4x minus 8 plus 1 minus 8, 4x minus 7. So y equals 1.9. So 4, see they give you easy numbers to work with here. 4 times 1.9 is not a hard thing to do. It's like 7.6 minus 7, y equals 0.6. Yeah, a lot of extra information here. Like, what, what, what do we mean by concave? Here? Like, really? Okay, so. All right, so moving on, moving on, moving on. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Yay. Function of the with C and D constants. If f is differentiable at x equals 2, what is the value of C plus D? It's differentiable. That means their derivatives need to be the same value at 2. Okay, so we set them, their derivatives equal to each other. Treating C and D like multiplying constants or adding constants. So uh, f prime of x will equal simply C. That will be 2x minus C. Okay, so those should be equal to 2. So, so when I plug in 2, they should be equal. So 2 times 2 minus C should equal C. So 4 minus C equals C. So 2C equals 4, so c equals 2, okay? All right, so now I, now I can use the fact that if they're differentiable, they must be continuous, so I can plug in 2 for c, so I have 2x plus d equals x squared minus 2c, and they must be continuous, so I should be able to plug in 2 for x and get the same thing, so 4 plus d equals uh, 4, wait, I should have plugged in 2 for c right there. I did. No, that was, that's an x. Okay, 4 minus 2 times 2. So that's basically 0. So um, uh, 4 plus d equals 0. So d equals negative 4. All right? So c, c equals 2. And uh, d equals negative 4. So c plus d should be negative 2. I hope I didn't mess that up. <laughs> Alright, so what is slope of the tangent line of the curve of y equals arctan? Arctan 4x to the point x equals negative 4. So this one we didn't do. Okay? Derivative arctangent is. We didn't do it. So I'm going to have to skip that one. And I'm going to have to bite that bullet. And since we didn't do it, I don't remember it. Alright? So, um, meh, meh, yeah, they didn't do it. Okay, wait, I probably figured it out some other way. Um, so, if this is the arc tangent, then the tangent must be equal to, um, tangent of y equals 4x. 
Okay. And so, um, basically, we can go write it this way. Why not? Let's go. So, secant squared y, y prime equals 4. All right. So, if x equals x equals one fourth. I had to find y in order to do it this way. So y prime equals four over secant squared y. So all right. So I have to find y. So I have to do this. Y equals tangent inverse of four times one fourth, which is one. So it's tangent inverse of one. So what's that saying? Is where is the no? What is that saying? Tangent theta equals one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where is the tangent? What theta is the tangent equal to one at? And we know it's pi over, it's, it's, it's pi over, pi over four. Okay, so y is equal to pi over four. And so I plug that in. So y prime equals four times, this is a much easier way to do, it, do this, guys. Um, secant so squared, um, pi over 4, but I cannot resist the challenge. So breaking that down, secant squared is 1 over cosine squared, so cosine, cosine pi over 4, then squared. Okay, so, so that, that is my answer, but I gotta figure out what that is. Um, y prime, okay, so all right, cosine pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, yes? And so we have y prime, yeah, that's an ugly one, 4 divided by one divided by square root of two over two squared, which is off to the side. Square root of two divided by two times square root of two divided by two equals two over four equals one half. So that basically is y prime equals four divided by one over one half. Flip that, that becomes one times two over one, which is two y prime equals four divided by two is two. Wow. So, yeah. A. Okay. All right. So, shown above is slope field for which of the following differential equations. So, remember, um, well, basically, you should be able to do kind of process of, of elimination, but here's a trick. Find out what it, when it's independent or when the slope is zero. See when the slope is zero right here? These are the tricks that, you know, I use. So basically, you should get the solution x equals negative 1 when dy dx is 0. So, um, as I can see though, is that, no? Yeah. Alright, so setting it equal to 0. Alright, and also you can see with a y, the y is equal to 0 when the slopes are zero. So your two solutions should be zero for y and negative one for x. So zero equals xy. Zero equals xy plus x. Factor out an x. Y plus one. X equals zero. Y equals negative one. What? Well, that didn't work. Okay, so try this one. Uh, zero equals xy plus y. Factor out a y y x plus one yeah y equals zero x equals negative one so that's a little trick that we were going to go into with our slope field section but we didn't have time okay all right cool so here we go here we go here we go yeah almost done okay so i i took 38 minutes on that section which is you had an hour unfortunately um too much talking i'm going to try to move faster so i can get this whole thing done in an hour and a half less explanation so that's slope so these are points so that's slope so that's the inverse the value of g prime of 3 okay So these dots are x and y, so input, output, slope, input, output, slope. This is your input, this is your output, 
this is your slope. But if you switch it now, if you switch it now, this is your output. This is your input. This is your output. So. or edit or something. <laughs> no connection play video. Ooh. Oh okay, so I'm going with negative one half. <laughs> that one got me. Um, all right, so now we're on the calculator portion. So get out your calculator, boys and girls. Um, let me try to zoom in just a little bit so you can still see what I'm doing, but I've got to be able to use my calculator too. Well, uh, F prime of X, you're not going to need your, you need your calculator for most of these. All right, derivative F, so that's derivative. Definitely increasing on negative two to one, but not only negative two to three. Hmm? Kind of stopped right there, but it doesn't say that it touches three to five. That's definitely not it. Not it, not it. So we're going four to five. And three to five. What? No. Three to five, three to five. No. So, yeah, we need that one. Okay. What's the following statement is true? No, true from the left. Well, of course it exists from the left. <laughs> yeah. So true from the right. Yeah. Two. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Check the domain because it you know it doesn't matter. One and two. One and two right. Okay. First derivative function. Prime of x over sine of y. Okay. So now I got to whip out my calculator. Okay, so, um, so y'all can see the question. Actually, that's the derivative, so this is the derivative. Above increase. Okay. That's my sign. Minus X one now zero to two. I'm already in trig mode basically anyway, so I'm good to go. More intervals of increasing. So we're only positive right here. So we're increasing right there. So I can probably
probably would guesstimate this. Well, a little trace at least. Second, no trace. So, oh, that's that's basically one. One, two. about 1.6 and 1.7 so uh, 1 to uh, 1.7 that would be good all right. all right so this one let's look integral from negative 5 to 2 y'all really can't see that one Negative 5 to 2, 17. Then 5 to 2, negative 4. Isn't that interesting? Negative 5 to 2 and then 2 to 5, but it's backwards. What's the value of negative 5 to 5? Well, that's backwards. So we know if it's written backwards, I know y'all can't see. I don't know what's going on right now. I'm trying to zoom. Let me rewrite it. That's correct, that's backwards. What that does is now the integral from two to five has got to be, basically all it is is subtraction, so that's gotta be four. So the total would be uh, negative 17 plus four, just negative 13. Good to go. Derivative of the function f, so that's the derivative. Y'all see that, okay good. How many points of inflection is F? So we want the double derivative. Um, really, it would be pointless to derive this at an equal to zero or less. So let's look at the function. So look at the function, x squared. My touch screen's not working. x squared cosine x squared all right, so negative two to two. Let's go ahead and set our window before we graph. This is aggravating to watch it graph and know you can't do anything about it. Oh my gosh. All right, how many points? You can, now, remember, we're looking at the, the derivative. So the second derivative is based off the derivative slope. So if we're looking for a point of inflection, we're not looking for where the concavity changes. Now we're looking for where the slope changes. So there's, I mean, look. One, two, three, four, So g of x is antiderivative for f. Uh, so g of x is the integral of f. g of 2 equals negative 7. Then g of 4, oh my gosh. g of 2 equals negative 7. Then g of 4. Oh, so they're giving us this. So g of 2 equals negative 7. Then g of x. Okay, so this is talking about a starting point. Uh, so, so like, let's say, let's say this. Um, so, g of g of four is basically going to be the same thing as g of two plus the integral from two to four. How much it changes of um, f of x dx? Does it say that? No, it doesn't. Well, since I know g of 2 equals negative 7, that can be rewritten like this. So that gives me... What? Hmm. Very, very interesting. Okay, so... Then g of 4 equals... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't see it right there. <laughs> it's E. Sorry. I, oh, my gosh. Y'all can't see. I'm sorry. So, yeah. There you go. So, moving on. What is the acceleration particle? The time scale is free. 
All right, so you just got to know velocity and acceleration. So here they're just asking for a simple acceleration. You can use your calculator all day long. So let's go to y equals clear. And then we got uh, 7 minus take away. Oh, this is not. Take away. Oh, geez. 7 take away. 1.01 Oh my gosh, cat. Oh. Negative, it says negative t squared. Y'all have the biggest font. I'm just gonna zoom in for you. Okay, so basically I can just do uh, math eight with this. Okay, um, so so math eight. So, blink, 0.054, so let's take a look, and it rounds up to 5.5, five, five. so yeah, for B. Let me go back to my, I'm at I'm 51 minutes, so I'm moving pretty slow, but What is the area enclosed by the curve x cubed minus 8x squared minus 19x? Okay, so you want to find the area enclosed, so we want to graph those. Okay, to find the area enclosed. So, this is going to take me forever. I wish I could just pause. Yep. Okay, we're back. I finally got it. Um, <laughs> I finally got it back to normal. So basically, this is a uh, two-part. As you can tell, it's a two-part graph. So it's it's got a little part up top and a part on the bottom, and we want to find both those areas right here. Okay, so we're gonna have to do two integrals. I had to pause because it takes so long to put this in the calculator. Okay, so the first one. Um, Let's, let's actually, we're going to have to, I'm going to pause and find the intersection points because it's just, this, like I said, this is taking absolutely way too much of your time. Alright, so we're back. I'm sorry. Those intersection points were crazy. Ended up, anyway, it ended up being 1, 2, and 5. Um, uh, those intersection points. This, is, this computer calculator is way too, way, it's very hard to use. Um, so... The first area is one, two, um, two. And if you take a look, the, the, the cubic function is on top. So I'm going to do the y1 uh, first. Uh, when I do my top minus bottom, this vars function y1 minus vars. Y2, okay, dx. And I'm going to go ahead and just add another math 9. And this one's going to be, what is it, 2 to 5? Yep, 2 to 5. Now, so this is what you're going to be doing on your final test. And I said I could do a whole AP exam in an hour. That's probably true. I probably would get some of it wrong though. Um, so this one's going to be y2 first. And keep in mind, uh, you can definitely um, fast forward. 
do whatever you need to fast forward. Like if you basically understand the basic premise of this and you want to see the answer, just go ahead. All right, look at my X. 6.562, Oh my gosh. That's not the answer. Oh, you know why? Because I multiplied them. I never had my plus sign. Oh my gosh. Second entry. This aggravating calculator. I will remember this day. Second insert. Minus. No, it's supposed to be plus. Plus. Enter. Alright, so 11.833 repeating, and that happens to be B. Okay. Wow, that was aggravating. Okay, so now here's where your caffeine you want to sip on. Anything with snacks might come in handy. Let's graph the derivative. Horizontal tangent lines, negative 1, 1, 3. I'm not really fading yet, though, yet. This is a good derivative function. So we're going to have the relative maximum. The relative maximum is where the derivative goes from positive to zero to negative. Okay? So let's look at this derivative. Where does it go from positive, which is above, to zero to negative? Right there at x equals 4. And it doesn't do that in any other place. Sorry. Don't do that in any other place. Just at 4. Positive, 0, or negative. Okay. Alright, so I'm just now at the hour mark, but that's because of this aggravating calculator, and I am kind of taking my time going through these problems. I've got about 7 more. Let's go. F prime of x is continuous on the integral of negative 4 to 1. What's the value of integral from negative 4 to 1? F prime of x dx. So, what does this give us? This gives us, you know it is, is net distance traveled, but actually it's, it's basically the change in f. So it gives us how, um, what f, the distance, or distance and direction of f's change. So where is f at negative four? So negative four, f is here. And then f at negative 1, at negative 1, f is here. So what is the net change? It's basically um, negative 1 for us. So I want to know, it went down, so basically negative 1.5 mi minus 0 0.075. Well, that ends up being negative 2.25. Here's the deal. Okay. Well, it gives the values of velocity of the particle moving along the x axis at time equals zero to particle of the origin. Where's the following to be the graph of the position x p of the particle on zero to four? So we're given the velocity, so we're decreasing, increasing, increasing, stop. Decreasing. So we start off decreasing. So we decrease for a little bit, and then at one at one we're increasing, but it doesn't tell us that it stops. Here it says it here for for answer. This answer says it stops at one. Well, uh, kind of increases at one, but we just got to do a little bit more investigating. We know it stops at three based on the table, so. So stops at three, stops at three, here's three, and here's three. Both stopping at three. Okay. This one looks like it's stopping at one. That's not decreasing right off the bat. That's not decreasing right off the bat. That's not. So it's it, the battle between these two is basically I think that's increasing and that's stopped. So I think C is the best answer. Okay, so an object traveling a straight line has position as x of t time t. If your initial position is x of 0 is 2, its velocity is blah, blah, blah. What is the position of the object at time t equals 3? Well, um, you don't want to do a whole bunch of C 
So here's a trick. You can either find a position function, or you could just integrate, find the net distance traveled, and know what time, know what time is zero. It starts at three. So we can integrate from zero to two for the velocity function. And basically, add two at the end. Yeah, because that's where it starts. You should have known. Okay, so yeah. So, uh, oh wait, no, we would integrate from zero to three because we want to find out where it is at time three. All right, so let's do it. Stinking calculator. Oh my gosh. I'm going to pause because this calculator is just atrocious. All right, that didn't take that long. I get the function in. Uh, 1 plus 2, uh, x squared to the 1 third power because uh, it's a cube root. So I'm going to quit it. I'm going to do 2. Literally, I'm adding the 2. 2 plus math 9, 0 to 3. Uh, I got it in a y sub 1, so vars. Starting to slur, I'm starting to stumble. My thoughts are going kind of mush, so I probably need to have some caffeine or a snack, which I'm going to do. All right. Radius of sphere is decreasing the rate of two centimeters per second. The instant with the radius of sphere is three centimeters. Now, right off here, I need to um, underline some important information. Okay, radius of sphere is decreasing. Remember dr dt. Okay, that's equals negative two. It's decreasing. And the instant with the radius of sphere. So radius is equal to three centimeters. What is the rate of change in centimeters per second? Square centimeters per second of the surface area of the sphere. Okay, and they give you the equation. Oh, awesome! So basically, we want to find what is the rate of change in. We want to find the change in the surface area with respect to time. That's what we want to find. Okay, so we need the surface area formula, which they graciously give us. Let me get this out of the way. Now remember, the radius is changing with respect to time, so it's r of t squared. So when I take the derivative, ds dt, to keep the inside, r of t, and then r prime of t. Okay? So ds dt, r dr dt. So plugging in the necessary infinite dr dt is equal to negative 2. So that's negative 2, so that's going to make that negative 16. Radius is equal to 3, so 3. So negative 16 times 3, uh, negative 32, negative 48, pi, is ds, dt. Cool. All right, and that should be one of the answers. Yeah, c. Okay, so a9, the function f is continuous for blah, 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 blah. Oh, wow, what is this? They all equal 0. <laughs> So if there's no c, which uh, negative 2 is less than c is less than um, 2, for which f prime of c equals 0. Okay, well this is cool. Th what this is saying is, you got to understand this graphically. This is saying if, if you, you're at negative 2, sorry, negative 2, and you're at 2, and this graph goes from negative 2 to 2 like this, okay? They're both at 0, right? Here's the y-axis. Okay, so basically this is saying that the derivative is never 0 between there, so it's never a horizontal line. How can that be? That's impossible, okay? The only way that could be, be is if um, somehow there was a break That way they can still both equal zero, and um, yeah, they can still both equal zero. That's the only way that it could occur if there was a break in the graph, okay? Which is uh, part of the mean value theorem. If they're flatlining right here, then they ought, they ought to be flatlining somewhere in there somewhere. But if it's not, they must be not continuous. There must not be a continuous. All right, so the function, oh, well, it says it's not continuous. Hmm. 
Well, that's interesting. Well, there must be a. Um, there must be some sort of a situation going on where. Uh, let's let's take a look at another graph. They say it's continuous. Hmm. If there is no C in Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so negative two to two. Okay. Remember this? Yeah. Must be some sort of undifferentiable point. Okay, undifferentiable point. All right, such as a cusp. That way, it's not equal to zero. So, for some k, f prime of k does not exist. That would be, um, you know, yeah, that would be the definition. The derivative does not exist there at some number in between there. So it's, it cusps and it doesn't continue. Okay, it doesn't continue in a smooth curve, otherwise it would have to be zero at some point. All right, so the function f is continuous, closed interval twice as original and the open interval two to four. If f prime of three equals two, and f double prime of x, so this means concave down. And f prime of three equals two, that means the slope is positive. So it's increasing. Increasing concave down on open interval two to four. Which of the following could be table of values for f? So increasing concave down from two to four. So they should be increasing and concave down. I don't know how you tell if they're concave down, but anyway, increasing. All right, increasing, 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 increasing. Well, those are increasing at a constant rate. So that's. That's a flat line. That's linear. So there's no concavity. These are increasing uh, 1.5, 2.5. So basically, that's like it's increasing faster. So 2 or here, here, and here, that's increasing faster. That's concave up. Okay? We need to be increasing slope, basically. So 2.5, 1.5. That's a good candidate. 2.5, 2, that's also a good candidate, uh, I think, 2 point, this is uh, 2, 2.5, that's not going to work, Let's see if I did anything wrong here, 5 to 7, 2.5, 5, 2.5, 2, so that's decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, and it says f prime of 3 equals 2, so, alright, so if f prime of 3 equals 2, that means the derivative at two is a derivative at three is two. So basically, um, it cannot equal two after the fact. Oh, sorry, y'all y'all can't see what I'm looking at. All right. So if f prime of three equals two, sorry about that. If f prime of three equals two, it can't equal two after three because it's supposed to be um, increasing in a decrease. The the increasing but. De we have some more cavity. It sh the point should be increasing in a decreasing fashion. So if it's 2 at 3, then it can't be 2 after 3. So that basically negates that as an answer and so the answer is A. Alright, whoo! Last two questions. Alright, 91. What is the average value of all that stuff? You can't see. So, uh, integral cosine x uh, x squared plus x plus 2. This is basically testing you. Do you know the average value tool? And so we know the average value tool is 1 over b minus a. Alright, so that's cool. Alright, that's, that's, that's what we got. So let's plug it in the calculator. And I'm going to pause so I'm not wasting too much of your time. All right, we're back. Um, I got the function in. I'm gonna math nine it right now. So I'll do the one fourth in later. 
But basically, I just want to plug the function in from negative one to uh, to three. Okay, bars. Uh, geez, no bars. Yeah, I'm fading. Okay. Of course, I'm taking the fourth of that, so I need to divide the answer by four. All right, so it's point zero point eight one three, which is answer from C. Last one. I think this is related rates. I don't know. A city located beside a river has a rectangle boundary as shown in the figure above. The population density of the city at any point along the strip x miles from the river's edge is uh, f of x persons per square mile. What is that fol which following expression gives the population of the city? So the population density of the city is people per square mile. Okay, so, all right. So people per square mile. So just kind of like feet per second, right? People per mile, feet per second. So if you want to get the population of the city, you need to integrate um, over the number of miles, just like you integrate over the number over the time to find out how much distance travels. So basically, um, now we're four by seven though. So you basically want to integrate um, over each square mile. So I'm assuming that, and I may be wrong um, because I'm not familiar with population density fun functions, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing as, you know, feet, people per mile, the same thing as uh, miles per hour. Um, so we can think of it like that. So basically how many square miles are there? There's four times seven, 28. So, um, what is it? Okay, let me back up. They would have got me though. It's X miles from the river's edge. So you're, it's F of X per person per, per square mile. Okay, so we can only integrate over this number of miles and that's gonna give me the number of the people per square mile. But then I have to multiply that by seven, okay? So the integral will get you that times seven. Okay, so zero to four times seven. B. Oh my goodness. All right, that concludes the multiple choice portion. I'll be posting this soon. That took me a way long time. I'm gonna grade this later. We'll grade later. All right, that took me about um, a, about an hour. Um, and it, my, my clock says a little bit more because I deal with aggravating calculator and I was explaining myself the whole time. So, yeah, hopefully it doesn't freak you out too much that it took the teacher an hour to do the, but they give you an hour and a half. And, um, and you know, I can't just, I can't be quiet. So, um, hopefully you can reflect on this and, and um, post on this and we'll talk to you later.